Welcome to the stage, Jada. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So you have been really at the center of kind of an, uh, a revolution in our understanding of, of human origins and really how the human story has played out across time um, through genetic analysis. And I was wondering if you might just give us kind of a basic understanding of the techniques that have allowed us to understand so much about our past, including like our mating with other hominids and the way that we dispersed across the earth. That's a, that's a Just real quick. Great, great <laughs> question. <laughs> I don't know if I could do it really quickly. Um, I, I think first I would, I would comment on how much technology has been intertwined with these, mm. these sorts of questions. Uh, because we can access genetics or genomics uh, more readily now because of the technologies that we have, we can answer these sorts of questions. Um, in the, f I'm, I guess it's over a little over 10 years now that I've been a professional anthropologist, I've seen a lot of the ideas about where humans came from, how we're related to one another, completely overturned um, because of what we know about genetics and how it works. Um, I would say, you know, the overall story that genetics is pointing to is the overall unity of, of humanity. Despite what our eyes tell us, despite how we might act, the languages we speak, from the standpoint of our biologies, we're all like literally one large, large family. Hmm. Um, and Let's start at the beginning of our story in Africa. Uh, I remember growing up and reading about, you know, us kind of coming from one small population there. And now it seems like genetics is really complicating that story. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so there are def de definitely different ideas as out there as to where um, our species originated. Um, I think genetics and, and increasingly um, paleoanthropology and sort of uh, looking at fossils um, melding those two fields together, we're seeing that it's actually pretty complex. Um, we know, for the most part, that yeah, our species did originate in, within southern, eastern, just kind of this general area of Africa. Um, and over, you know, t long periods of times, people dispersed. Uh, and not only did they disperse out, they came back, which mm -hmm. again sort of complicates the picture um, when you're looking at genetics or you're looking at at fossils. Uh, but the overall story is that we have a series of dispersals where bits, small bits of uh, human groups would leave, um, adapt to a particular environment. They might migrate back, they might migrate out, and other groups would leave, adapt to specific environments. Uh, and it's, it's a really complicated <coughs> picture, uh, but what we, you know, what we overall see is that it's just a series of what we call founders effects um, across, across the globe. Can you, uh, as as migration has come to become uh, quite a politically fraught subject in our own world today, can you talk about how the mechanisms that cause uh, dispersals, as you phrase them, have changed over time? Um, I, th I think there's, there's all sorts of reasons people might move on from one area. Yeah. Um, sometimes it's purposeful, right? You're, you're leaving for, you know, you're oppressed or for whatever reason you can no longer live um, in those environments. Uh, I'd say, you know, of more recent times, you know, politics definitely plays a role. Um, war, in, in some cases even disease, has been known to, to cause people to move around. I think the story of, of humanity kind of s centers around that. There's always reasons why people have moved on and moved, moved across large areas of, of geography. Uh, I want to ask you about the Neanderthals before we get to some of the more okay. um, contemporary uh, diasporas, which as I know is uh, what you work on specifically. Um, uh, I'm fascinated by this question as to what happened. First of all, I want to talk a little bit about how interrelated we turn out to be to Neanderthals, which came as quite a shock to me. Um, but also, uh, how do you think we'll ever know what happened to them? And is this, I, I just have this sense that like maybe that story is not going to look so good for us. There's, that's been floated before. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's been floated before. It's really interesting. Um, in the last probably 20 years, our ideas about our relationship with Neanderthals have changed. Um, I remember learning uh, back in the day in graduate school that uh, Homo sapiens, our species, and Neanderthals, we didn't mix because, you know, looking at one genetic marker, there was not any sort of indication that we shared ancestry. And now because we have improved technology, um, we can actually sequence uh, the DNA of extinct humans, and we could see, using bioinformatics, see uh, the signatures that they've left in, in some modern peoples. Um, so it's, it's really interesting. It's kind of changed our narrative uh, in terms of how, how we understand 
our species to have interacted with other, other types of humans. Uh, are there similar, mar do we also interact with other hominid groups? So I think there's good evidence that this did occur. Um, there's another human species, Den Denisovans, I don't know if I always, mm -hmm. I'm saying that right, um, but this is always fascinating to me because uh, for uh, essentially all of the other fossil humans or hominids that we've identified, we've got multiple pieces of, of fossil. Uh, with Denisovans, it's just a little, little finger bone and another fragment of a bone, uh, but it was preserved well enough to do DNA studies. And from that, we, we came to realize that, hey, there's, there was another human species. Um, we also see, you know, again, using bioinformatics, uh, within Africa there are likely other hominid species that we don't know about. We don't have fossils from them. But we see their signatures in our DNA, which is indicative of humans, homo sapiens, have kind of mixed with other types of humans that, that no longer exist. And I, I'm really interested in the way that you're using this word human um, as not to refer specifically um, to uh, our particular lineage. Where do you draw that line? Like who counts as a human and who isn't? I See, I, I, I have a hard time with it um, yeah. because if we exchange genes like we made babies, I, I, I would like to think that you would recognize that other person as a human before you would do something like that, right? <laughs> <laughs> Don't go on the internet. Um. <laughs> But, <laughs> no, but my, my point is, is that our idea of thinking about difference, well, you, we recognize them as humans. Yeah. They were a different type of, of human. We can get into sem semantics and uh, discuss whether it should be a subspecies or a different species. Um, but the fact is, is, is that if we recognize them as mates and potentially exchanged genes with them, then um, I, don't, I don't think it's that hard to say, yeah, they're human, human-like. Hmm. Um, what about North America, where we live? Uh, tell me a little bit about how genetic analysis is sort of complicating the picture as to how this continent was peopled. Right, so genetic analysis is, uh, it, it's interesting. Um, first and foremost, I think it's really important to recognize the historical and social context in which this work is done. Mm -hmm. um, the field, anthropology specifically, has a very storied history, um, particularly with indigenous groups in the Americas. There were a lot of, a lot of exploitation and abuse. Um, and when genetics entered the picture, it was within that context. Um, genetics has the potential to tell a story, but it's also very important to remember uh, if a community wants that story told. Um, and that, that question was not always asked of, of various communities. Um, my work is primarily in the Caribbean, um, and there actually are some indigenous groups remaining that identify, self-identify as indigenous. Uh, for me, introducing genetic technologies and uh, ways of addressing questions using genetic data, it's been very interesting. It's actually slightly different than what you see uh, among uh, North American indigenous groups. Uh, in the Caribbean, there are these narratives of extinction, that shortly after Columbus arrived, the native peoples were decimated. What we're seeing now in the DNA is that that's not, not, not the case. Um, historically, socially, people didn't identify as indigenous because it was seen um, uh, very poor, as to, be, uh, to be bad. It was, it was nothing that anybody wanted to uh, identify with. Uh, and these, there's a change now. People are more readily accepting this. Um, and for them, these genetic technologies are useful because it allows them to begin to explore history that, that was erased. Uh, in North America, the picture again is a little bit different because they already have a very rich history um, of knowing who they are, um, where they came from. So genetics for some group doesn't, don't really matter. Uh, for others, you know, it's, it's potentially useful. Uh, but again, it's always important when we do this work is to put the community first and think about how these technologies potentially can impact them. Can you say a little bit more about that? What are the specific objections that uh, some of these groups have to participating in this research? Uh, some of the objections are researchers, um, some, of, some of my colleagues uh, can potentially come into a community, get their samples and leave, and you never see them again. Um, there's no sort of community engagement or involvement as to, okay, what are the questions you're asking? How does this help our community? How does this help us tell our story or, or learn more about ourselves? Um, there have been objections to using genetic data to say, oh, this particular native group actually came from over here. So they're not native to this group uh, or to this area. Uh, and then, you know, legitimately, some people would be worried about their claims to land, their claims to the resources. 
uh, other issues really have to do with inclusion. Uh, are these groups being consulted? Are the people doing the genetic data? Are they coming from the community? Hmm. How is, I always think about this in the context of um, the telescopes down in the Atacama Desert in Chile, which uh, have, um, it's one of the best places on planet Earth to do astronomy because there's very little moisture in the air, so you can sort of see, have a real clear window into the universe. And what they did to kind of stand up, there was not a robust um, sort of first class uh, astronomy departments down at universities in Chile. And so what they did when they put those telescopes there is the government negotiated a deal such that 10% of the telescope time on those facilities had to go um, to uh, the local populations. And so over time, obviously you can't in a single generation um, uh, be kind of MIT, but over time you're getting really sophisticated astronomy being done in those countries. Are there, are there attempts like that in your field? There, there are, there are. Um, I don't remember the, the full name of the uh, full acronym, but it's SING. Um, so I have uh, collaborators at various universities who actually put on summer programs to uh, engage and involve indigenous people in genomic research. And this mm -hmm. has been going on for a number of years and actually has spread um, across the globe. So there are SING uh, groups now in Canada, Australia, uh, and New Zealand. Um, I think they're starting one in Mexico soon. But the express purpose is to be able to get um, indigenous scholars in the labs uh, so that they can be the ones that are asking questions that are important to their communities. Hmm. Um, going back to the actual sort of substance of the peopling of the Americas, I was wondering if, uh, what is the sort of, and it, the field seems to me to be very fast moving and I follow it from some distance, so you should correct me if I'm wrong, but um, uh, the story that I understand now is now there's some confusion over whether there was actually a land bridge or, or whether people came on boats at first and then, but once they got there some, you know, over into uh, Alaska some 16,000 years ago or thereabouts, um, they seem to just have ripped down the Americas, like something like 1,500 years. Is that accurate? That, that sounds, there's a lot of debate yeah, yeah, still yeah, yeah. going, still, still going on, um, questions as to if, um, the, dis the dispersals were along land, uh -huh. or was it across using uh, the coast? Yeah. Um, so there's still a lot of, it's, a, it's still an open field. There's a lot still to be. Um, Is there a more learned. extraordinary, like, uh, 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 like thinking about migration, like a movement of people across space in Earth's history than that? Uh, it's, it's hard to judge, right? Because it's yeah. pretty audacious to, to up and leave, you know, the continent that, as far as you know, all, all everyone came before you was from there. Yeah. Um, so I think dispersal in general is, is pretty bold. Hmm. This is uh, in line with um, your, uh, what we were talking about earlier about some of the objections that indigenous communities might have in participating with this research. But you're also seeing kind of a pervasive new cultural sense that people are quite uncomfortable with having their DNA sequenced. So, like, I was super excited to do Ancestry and then kind of passed because um, I don't want the feds to find me. Uh, I keep a low profile. Um, and uh, yeah, I just wonder, is, is your work going to get harder? Or do your colleagues, is everyone actively fretting that like it's going to be very hard to collect DNA soon? I, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. um, I think with appropriate informed consent, when you tell people this is what I'm doing and this is how, you know, the effort I will make to protect your data. Um, Talk I, about that a little bit. What are the efforts to protect the data? Uh, so when I do uh, my own research, the samples stay in my lab. I don't pass samples out. Um, when I publish papers, it's just sort of an academic standard that data becomes available. Mm -hmm. um, but it's de-identified. No one will know uh, any specific name. Uh, that is, that is attached to it. And I tell you know, any study participant that wants to join my study, this is, this is what it is, this is what we, um, what we do. Uh, let's see, what else do I? I think the most important thing really is, is just conveying a sense of stewardship with those samples. Mm -hmm. um, that once somebody trusts me enough to give me their DNA, I'm actually going to look after it. And how do you know that the standards that you approach that data with will continue on in perpetuity under, you know, uh, forget different political regimes, but even different scientific regimes? It's, it's hard to project into the future, but I know that I'm not alone um, in this yeah. stance as to how I treat genetic data, how I treat, or how uh, even my colleagues would treat bones and other material culture. Uh, there, there's a, a lot of active discussion going on within our field with, uh, with regard to ethics. Mm -hmm. um, and in particular, uh, 
more discussion around community involvement and community engagement. Hmm. Um, it, suppose that uh, you could get everyone, sort of uh, collect everyone's DNA on, on planet Earth. Uh, what kind of big uh, historical and anthropological mysteries uh, could still be solved, uh, provided you had access to everyone's data? What? Oh. That's a big question. Yeah, it's like <laughs> carte blanche. <laughs> I, I, there's a million directions I would go in that. Yeah. Um, if I had a magic wand and could figure out everything, I would really want to know more about the relationship between social environments and disease. Mm. Well, social environments, genetics, and disease. Um, that, that would mm. kind of fascinate me. So, the, you know, that if we knew that, we'd know where it would be best to put our efforts. Should we, we be working on medical treatments when, in fact, it's a social, mm -hmm. a social disease? Maybe, maybe we shouldn't put that on the internet. Um, <laughs> Give me but an social example. factors that cause disease. Yeah. Um, so things like um, uh, diabetes, right? Right. Um, we we understand that there's some genetic component to this, right? So it, you might be more susceptible, have the alleles that make you more susceptible uh, to developing diabetes as an adult. On the other hand, if you're in an environment uh, where you don't have good quality food, mm -hmm. um, where these sort of these structural inequalities exist um, that contribute to an unhealthy lifestyle that then leads on. Uh, to diabetes, perhaps it would be in our best interest to think about how do we change the environment, how culturally, how do we change, um, and then focus at a later point on mitigating the genetic susceptibilities to disease. Hmm. Are you jealous of your uh, the sort of the the anthropologists of the 22nd century? Are they going to be able to do really cool things? I'm not jealous. I, I see myself tied to them, so I got to yeah. do what I have to do um, <laughs> so that they can do what they'll do. All right. Um, yeah. <laughs>